Namaste and in Lockett, and welcome to this edition of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and as always, I'm going to reflect on those two phrases. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit, spoken it's Brahmi, it means the divine in me, recognizes the divine in you. In Lockett comes from the other side of the world, and it means I am another you. So greet each other from that perspective, and just test that notion within you and how you greet others on a daily basis and you will find a phenomenal change in your life but don't believe me test it for yourself so this week's guest is mark victor i've known mark for probably a couple of decades now i'm guessing and we see each other every once in a while i really admire what he does as far as his attorney work he, he's uh manages an attorney, uh, Attorneys for Freedom Law, that's in uh, Mesa, Arizona. And he's been doing this for almost 20 years now. He's got uh, almost 30 different lawyers that, that, that work with him uh, under the, the banner of uh, freedom and being able to support others. Mark's got a, uh, uh, he's Arizona State Bar Certified Specialist in Criminal Law. And now he, uh, he's also, let me not forget this, a veteran from the United States Marines. So thank you for your service, Mark. And he's now decided to run for Senate in Arizona in 2022, which I think is phenomenal. Mark, welcome. Yeah, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be on your show, Zen, and great to uh, connect again after all these years. And a couple little tiny corrections. Oh, please. The Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm is in Chandler. And while we have almost 30 employees now, not all of them are lawyers. Uh, interesting, though, uh, all of the lawyers are very pro-freedom because we're the Attorneys for Freedom. I don't even interview them if they're not first uh, very pro-freedom. And then this one, I, I wish I, I didn't have to correct, but uh, I've been practicing now almost 30 years. Uh, I, I don't know where the time went, but yeah, I'm about 28 years now into representing people in uh, criminal cases, state court, federal court, uh, and lots of national cases. We've been doing uh, lots of cases in different states as well. Awesome. Uh, and, and great work. The I, I think where I got that from was the, uh, the actual... Um, organization that you created is about 20 years old. And I think that's probably where that came from. Is that a little more correct? Well, uh, we changed the name. We used to be Mark J. Victor PC. But then as people started applying for work and saying to me, Mark, I want to work at a pro-freedom law firm. I started acquiring lawyers who were also very hardcore pro-freedom. They worked, wanted to work at a place that uh, takes a position for a free society, free world. Uh, we're very pro-peace at our firm. And so uh, after we started collecting lawyers who were for freedom, I said, you know what? We should change the name of the firm to the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm. So that's uh, where that came from. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad we got that cleared up. You know, it's wonderful when, when misunderstanding takes place and, and you can have the clarity that comes from it. So thank you for that. So what I'd like to do, though, is I, I know, let's go back a little bit, and, and you've had some interesting bouts in, in how you came about doing what you do, and from an inner perspective, because this is where I like to begin from, is we all have that inner perspective that we don't necessarily talk about or give the opportunity to, and, and oftentimes, at least in recent history, uh, that hasn't been too acceptable to to share with others. So with the the inner perspective of, of your life, how did you first begin to understand your direction and that inner knowing or inner guide that we all have? Well, boy, tough question, uh, but good question. I think that, uh, you know, the longer you're on the planet, the more you grow and mature and change and hopefully improve. I like to uh, very often bring out a, uh, a new, better version of Mark J. Victor. And so I feel like I keep improving. And, uh, you know, I guess when I started, uh, you know, I've always been interested in what should be the rules of the world. And so uh, that sort of guided me to the criminal justice system, because that's where the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, Absolutely. that's 
Yeah, that's where somebody from the says, hey, I'm from the government, I'm going to throw you in a cage. And so uh, that gets real uh, very quickly. But over the years, um, you know, I've been very careful to, uh, in some ways, moderate uh, positions or moderate how I deliver those positions. And I think I could say over the years, I've become more well-rounded. Uh, I'm actually a, a meditator. I meditate every day, if not uh, every day, then almost every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of meditation. I think um, it's hard to talk about freedom without talking about meditation because meditation is about, in my view, inner freedom and inner peace. And uh, if you can't achieve that first, you're probably not going to be very successful uh, spreading this, you know, more generally to the, the rest of our fellow brothers and sisters is how I like to say it. Um, and, and, you know, when you say things like that, I think it's important to mean it, right? It's not, um, it's not just a matter of what you say, um, but can you walk uh, the walk as well. You know, it's yeah. not just talk the talk, but you got to be able to walk the walk. And so um, at my firm anyways, we've, I set the tone for the firm and I, I try to attract people who agree with certain types of philosophies. And in fact, right now uh, we're in the midst of a, what we call a health challenge here at the firm, which involves uh, uh, stepping up exercise programs, stepping up uh, what we consume and what we put into our bodies and uh, you, you can eat anything you want, of course, but I'm a big believer in a whole food plant-based diet. I think this is probably the healthiest diet. I think it's the most ethical diet. Yeah, I said that. I think mm -hmm. there's an issue there uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that I used to sort of just- Life is life, right? Life is life. Absolutely. doesn't mean everything's equal. I'm, I don't think humans are equal to uh, crickets. But on the other hand, I don't indiscriminately kill crickets either. If I can shoot right. them out of the house, I shoot them out of the house. I think life is important. I don't think you uproot plants for the well, sake. We don't have the, the, the type of mentality like with the indigenous philosophy that, you know, you respect life and you honor it and you ask for what you need and you respect when, when you know, in the nature of being able to feed, clothe, and how their, house our families, right? There's this working with nature. We are yeah. nature. We're exactly. part of nature. Right. Exactly. And, and so, yeah, to say that you're, you know, for life, um, or as, as uh, you know, I was raised in a Jewish tradition, and we say l'chaim, which means to life. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. celebrate yeah. life. Well, now you're dealing with all the Michigas. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so I think that all of this begins with a respect for life. If you don't respect for life, respect life, you're sort of a thug, and uh, you're never going to understand a, either a pro freedom or a pro peace position. Right. And so uh, I think it's critically important uh, what you're doing and what you're raising in terms of awareness, how you began your show. I think this was wonderful. I, I think more people should be. Uh, more in touch with their inner lives. Absolutely. And, and like you leading by example, that's what I hope to do with the gifts and, and skills that I've been given as we all, in my opinion, are learning how to do, especially in this period now where we're coming out of this constraint, constrained and constricted living now that, and I turned to my wife when it first started and I said, you know, I really hope this obsession on self-hygiene and self-frustration will get people to turn inward and questioning themselves and what they really stand for. Yeah. And I think that's happening. I, I see the evidence of it, especially in the virtual world where people are seeking each other from around the world and learning how to work together and, and demonstrating the process of, of figuring out how to work through the ambiguity yeah. in order to find a, a safe place and uh, to create a better future together. Totally. totally. Now, speaking of, you recently, um, the, the let, live and let live philosophy that you have in the organization you've created around that, how did that begin and what were the, I guess, the, the, the premises that you had for being able to engage not only yourself, but others and others in the process? Wow, excellent question. Um, well, for starters, I, um, 
you know, I, I guess I've always been a live and let live kind of guy. I mean, to me, I never had to be convinced uh, about this sort of phrase, live and let live. It always made sense to me. It's, it's one of those things that to me seems absolutely self-evident. And uh, that's, that's, I guess, what led me to fall into this libertarian crowd, which is where I resided for decades. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of for years been scratching my head and saying, why, why aren't the libertarians the dominant political philosophy? What they're saying obviously makes sense. But there was always a piece missing because I've always considered myself a peace activist and libertarianism is about freedom. And as you know, libertarians sometimes talk about the non-aggression principle and compliance with the non-aggression principle is great to achieve freedom, but peace requires something else. And there was just that section of things that was missing. And so I would ask myself, why aren't the libertarians making more progress? And so it occurred to me that um, they didn't lead with this principle, you know, and I'm guilty of this myself, the much mm -hmm. younger Mark Victor, uh, you know, might have met you, uh, shaken your hand and said, you know, I think meth should be legal or something like that. And, you know, people hear that and they turn their brains off. That's because I skipped over the reason. I skipped over the principle that's involved, the fundamental principle. And, and that's as choice. I, yeah, as I've gotten older, I've recognized the importance of principles, which is on a little side note, one of the reasons my very favorite book, or at least one of my favorite books is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. He talks about principles in there. I run my firm based off of that book and those principles. I run my whole life off of, for example, I think win-win in every deal that I right. do. Business and I would say you also include Senge's work. I, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Well, uh, the, the Fifth Discipline was a book that he wrote in the 90s, and he became kind of an uh, overnight sensation in corporate consulting because he dealt with systems thinking, self-mastery, learning organizations. These were premise, premises yeah. that he put forth in the Fifth Discipline, and those are really critical for imperative, if you will, for developing people, places, and things working together better. Yeah, there are certain things in the world that just work, right? Like, mm -hmm. for example, thinking win-win. This works. If you're interested in building long-term relationships based on high levels of trust with other people, this works, right? This is a good way to improve your life. So I started um, giving speeches entitled Libertarian Professionalism, and I started saying things like, let's lead with the principle, and let's stop arguing about crazy little issues. We're all brothers and sisters. Let's unite around this principle and put it out there in a very professional way and not argue about little questions about how would we transition from here to there or how would we implement little questions. And I wrote an article and I was talking about this principle and I described, I said, look, it's just a principle. It could be described as the non-aggression principle. John Stuart Mill called it the harm principle. Uh, uh, some People from the Judeo-Christian tradition might call it living the golden rule, or you could just say live and let live. And when I said live and let live, that resonated with people. People said, you know, yeah, now I get it. I'm for live and let live. So originally this started as a better way to explain that principle. But shortly thereafter, um, it occurred to me and the other people involved in the movement that we were missing something very important. It's not just a legal principle. That'll get you to freedom. That's great. But there's a moral principle in there, an area where we're not trying to force anybody to do anything, but we're making some important suggestions. Mm -hmm. And so the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement was born, and it hasn't officially launched yet. It launches in March of 2023, but we're very much committed to the phrase live and let live. I mean, this isn't that confusing, right? I now, mean, here's some interesting. So this is one thing that's rare in developing organizations or movements or things like that. Uh, a lot of folks tend to want to jump the gun and, and come up with an idea, entrepreneurs especially, where they leap ahead with things and the proper strategy implementation, planning, all of those things, getting your ducks in a row, so to speak. And from a project manager position, which is one of the hats that I've worn, you've got to have all those things in place in order for flow 
otherwise you got bottlenecks and the better even if the, you slow down to move fast right so you're taking yeah. time to develop this from a very fundamental place and having the solid structure and foundation to build from absolutely i mean if you're going to push a global peace movement uh most people are going to say oh sure let me know when you take over the world or something like that so uh to avoid that it's got to be done right uh, you need a world-class website. You need high-quality people helping offload the movement. You need support for chapters. And uh, you got to really think about the message and all of that. We're laying the groundwork. And so it's, uh, it's actually evolved into a fairly simple message. We say, look, we're for live and let live. Really simple. Now, if you say, no, I'm not for live and let live, okay, I might have 60 seconds to talk to you about why. Do you have the, what's the problem here? Live right. or let right. live, right? But most people agree with this phrase. And so we stick to it very, very tight, you know? And so there's, it's not confusing. There's live and then there's let live. What could live possibly mean, right? Live. Right. Well, it's like we come into this, in my opinion, we come into this world with two th agendas, to love and be loved. And that's what love or live and let live epitomizes to me um, now one of the things that i also have noticed and i'm sure you have too is that initially we have all these verbose ideas of how to articulate a message and then it's distilled down over the years into the simple phrases like live and let live and that when you really understand that or have the time to explore it you unpack all kinds of different things that are connected with that across the spectrum from individual relationships to communities to education to industry to politics even <laughs> and this notion of growing together becomes present where you know in the past last century especially the industrial age technology and technological age had this notion of pyramidal structures with alpha males at the top competing against each other well, we found out that really doesn't work, and, and we're right in the middle of one of those um, the places of Michigas where it, it's obvious that it's not working. And now we're trying to figure out how do we move forward together, and the pain has become great enough that we're actually willing to change. So how does that change look to you? And you can describe it in broad terms, but I'd like to know maybe a little more of the specifics of, of how you see that playing out here in Arizona. Well, um, we're a global movement. So although I love Arizona and I live in Arizona and I'm running for Senate in Arizona, our community is the world today, whether we like it or not, whether we wish it was otherwise or not. I mean, the Corona thing is a great example, right? Somebody did something in China and the rest of the world is now suffering. And so there are many, many threats that are coming down the road that we can't ignore. We can't just say, let's just worry about our little community and ignore everything else. This is why I've never liked uh, this America first policy. To me, mm -hmm. it should be win-win, right? Let's, let's take care of everybody as best we can and let's do it for the right reasons. Let's not put it into the law. That's never how you get things done properly. You gotta win hearts and minds. This and you change it from adversarial relationships to collaborative relationships. That's right. So our movement is focused on simply trying to win hearts and minds. And the message is very simple. It's just simply live and let live. We think live means that you're in charge of your life, right? You're in charge of you. What else could live possibly mean? <coughs> Excuse me. And that would also seem to allude to doing things that cause no harm of course right so that here's how we explain it we say live means you're in charge of your life you're the iron-fisted dictator of your body property money time you are in charge of you so anything else that i could say about your life would simply be suggestions and that's okay. We have lots of suggestions. This is how we derive what we call in our movement, the moral principle, which we simply explain as be a good human. That's our suggestion, be a good human. And so we have aspirational values that we're pushing in this space. We describe them as open-mindedness and tolerance and voluntary kindness and civility, 
in a commitment to truth and facts and justice, things that would optimize human happiness and well-being while minimizing human suffering. That's our moral principle. They're all suggestions. You are completely free to ignore everything we say in this space because you're in charge of you. But the let live part, well, this is not a suggestion. This is mandatory. What could let live mean other than simply let other people live exactly the way you have a right to live, which is to be the iron-fisted dictator of themselves? <coughs> Excuse me. And so this gets to what you were just saying. So we derive a legal principle from the let live part of this, which is don't be an aggressor, right? You have no right to aggress against another person. When you do this, you're violating their right to live. So what's an aggressor? Somebody who initiates force against another person or their property, somebody who's involved in fraud, somebody who's involved in coercion, or any, someone who does anything that creates a substantial risk of harm to another person or their property. That should always be against the law. And we mm -hmm. should do everything we can do to stop people from being aggressors. Yeah, That's and if I'm another you, why would I want to treat you that way? Because I certainly wouldn't treat me that way. That's violating the let live part of our our phrase, right? So if you believe in live and let live, it's really not that confusing. Live your life. You're in charge of you, but let other people live their lives. And I think the very important takeaway here is to make sure that you understand the difference between a legal rule and an ethical or moral rule, right? What we're trying to say is, look, our morality, our personal morality should be outside the law, but we can still advocate for it. And there are lots of things we advocate for. What we're really teaching people here is how to think about issues, right? Because issues will arise. There'll be issues. No, but I don't want to think. I just want what I want, right? <laughs> I'm, just, I, I'm being kind of facetious, but that's yes. generally, you know, I heard the guy, the uh, public speaker that, that's building an organization of, of helpfulness, state that you know most people just don't want to think and, and that's kind of sad and i wonder what why do, why would you if you agree with that why do you think that happens well i don't know that i would say most people don't want to think i think people act in ways that they perceive are in their interest and i think that's perfectly fine what I want to show them is that live and let live is in our mutual interest. It's the ultimate win-win, right? Mm -hmm. Because you get to live how you want. I get to live how I want. We each let each other live. If we're going to have a civilized society, a free world, a peaceful world, we have to come together around this notion of live and let live. This should be obviously true to people who think about it. In fact, I haven't yet met anybody who said to me, no, Mark, I don't agree with live and let live. I can't even imagine what that discussion would be. I'm, I'm interested right. to see the first person who says this to me because I'm going to say to them, well, what is it you disagree with here? The live part or the let live part, right? Very likely, we will, very likely will be the let live part, right? Because everybody sort of wants to run their own lives and be in charge of their own body properly. Well, and we tend to want to control others. That's what we, that's well. the price we got to pay right there. We, if that's the price we got to pay, that's the down payment. If you want peace, you can talk about it. You're never going to get it unless you're willing to pay the price, which means you have to be comfortable with allowing other competent adults to live in ways that you personally disagree with, mm -hmm. things that you might find unhealthy or- I've heard that called intellectual humility. Yes, I love that phrase, intellectual humility. I think that's that's fantastic. And I think that that's the cost. If you're not willing to pay that cost, in other words, said a different way, you mm -hmm. just are dead set on wanting to control other people. Well, you're simply setting up a war of all against all, right? That's where we are now. Everybody fights to get control of the government to impose their views of how to live on everybody else. I wanna stop playing that game. This is a ridiculous, this is a fool's game. We should come together. First, we need to recognize we're all brothers and sisters, really. We're all humans. We're on the planet for a very short period of time. We're very, very lucky to be alive at the best time so far to be alive on the planet. 
We, um, we have lots to celebrate. We're here for a short time. Nobody gets to get out alive, right? We're all right. here. We should celebrate the fact that not only that we're alive, but we're alive at the same time and we can yeah, interact. Yeah. And, and you know, the, this, um, the, the image that I have behind me kind of puts that into perspective because, yeah. you know, we live in one world. Yeah. And, you know, the, the picture originally, I'm, I'm not sure which astronaut took it, but I had the opportunity. I, I met Edgar Mitchell years ago. He was the sixth man on the moon. And what a wonderful gentleman he was and, and we had some really deep conversations over a period of time i was managing an a, a event out in uh, levine called the prophets conferences back in 97 and edgar shared with me the epiphany that he had of looking at the earth from space and how he felt the communion with real with this greater perspective of reality and how small he felt in that well even in that feeling of, of being small he came back here and started the institute of noetic sciences which was instrumental in in helping forward this kind of live and let live notion the the reality that there is a consciousness that's greater than us and we can tune into it because we're all connected to it internally and that seems to be in, in my opinion, and I believe others, maybe yours too, uh, and I'll ask you this question. Do you see that as being one of the core recognitions or uh, moments of self-awareness of that interconnection with a greater reality that grows over time and provides guidance, even flow, synchronicities people that you meet places that you go opportunities that that created and the more you reside in that place of flow and 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 the live and let live the the greater the the experience of it is and that could be evidenced by you actually running for senate again yeah i mean i think one of my favorite words is balance i think uh balance is very important in life and i think in in some ways uh, we're certainly connected. We live on the same little tiny planet in this humongous, as best we can tell, infinite universe, right? It's the only home we have. That connects us all by right. itself. You look, I look at that picture over your shoulder and I say, that's it. That's where we live. And there is nowhere else. I can't believe we can't get along. It's how well, hard. there might be. We just can't go there yet. Not yet. <laughs> that's all we got for right now. Uh, and in other ways, I, I recognize that we're all individuals and we're entitled to make different choices. I think that we just need to start respecting, really respecting, not just paying lip service to it, but really respecting the rights of other people to chart their own course and to run, the, to define and to pursue their own happiness. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this. You mentioned balance. Let, let's take it a step further. And, and how would you ascribe this in the perspective of harmony? Um, from my perspective of harmony, I'll offer that to, as a point to reflect on. Harmony simply is the management of chaos because there's a natural order within that that we don't necessarily recognize because we're seeing it as chaos. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much we don't know about how the universe works, right? We're just scratching the surface of what is yet to be known. And yeah, so we're finding out 99% of it's just empty, you know, it's space, right? <laughs> Which means you're not you. Intellect, you're right. Intellectual <laughs> humility, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that we, we should be humble. Um, and I think that, look, none of us was born knowing the secrets to the universe. None of us was born knowing what's absolutely right and wrong. I think we're all, we all found ourselves here. We all have ideas about how we got here, where we're going, what we're doing here, and that's okay. Can we just treat each other with dignity and respect while we're here? And I would say celebrate our differences, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to believe, Zen, that it's 2022, and it's still an issue over things like what we're color, still having diversity issues. What color your skin is? Are yeah. you me? I can't Come believe on. it's still it's an 21st issue. 21st century already. Yeah, and this is one thing I'm very, very proud 
uh, about with the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement, we consider ourselves post-racial. We don't care what color your skin is, where you were born, what language you speak, who you love, any of that stuff. We care that you're peaceful. We care that you respect our legal principle and you're not an aggressor. And we love it if you adopted our moral principle and just advocated to be a good human. You know what that means. If you had a good parent who taught you some important lessons, don't pretend like you don't know what be a good human means. Okay, there's some things around the edges to argue about, but for the most part, be kind to other humans, right? Treat right. them like you'd want them to treat you. That's what Live and Let Live is about. This is why it's growing so fast. We're already in about 20 different countries worldwide. We're growing very, very fast. We have chapters all over the place. Um, I'd love to tell your audience that if they're interested, and they certainly should be in the Live and Let Live movement, check it out. Go to liveandletlive.org. I'll have, have a, that in the description as well. Oh, excellent. We have a temporary website right there. It's under, uh, it's being redesigned right now. I'm very excited. We're going to put it in lots of different languages and really build it out nice. This isn't something that we're doing sort of as a fun little side project. I can assure you the people involved in this movement are very serious about changing the world for the better. And that's what we all need to be serious about at this point, because it is that individual stepping up and being accountable, doing the things that you're, that you know, you know, the, there's a sense that comes along with that or resonance. We're talking about the, the space and the particles and, you know, that uh, from my experience, I had a, uh, question as a teenager, I was in pre-med program and I was uh, adopted early. I was orphaned as a kid given up for adoption. And so when I found out I was adopted, I went inside and started asking questions and <laughs> developed a, a conversation with this inner voice and didn't know who it was, didn't care. It was trustworthy and it proved it over time. And then as a teenager, I prayed to know what truth was and was willing to die for it if necessary. And a few days later, happened to be 11-11 of 1975, uh, the voice came to me during meditations and asked me by my given name, which is Bruce, Bruce, would you, uh, are you willing to die for what you believe in? And, you know, I had to kind of pucker, uh, I say I butt puckered, um, but, you know, I, I just felt this moment of constriction is what do I believe in? And the first thing that came to mind was Christ consciousness, felt a little empty. Second thing was Christ, was cosmic consciousness. It felt full. And I think it's because it's the formless version of it and I said yes and before I knew it I was in the white light I had this it was this iridescent effervescent high-pitched sensation and then I moved from there into a sphere of pinpoints of light with an indigo background and I knew the points of light points of consciousness whether in body or not I wasn't sure and this was 18 year old that was having all this go on right and so when I came back I had this innate understanding that we are all cosmic consciousness condensed into form. And there's this point of light. It may be infinitesimal inside of us. that's connected to everything that bounces back and forth between here and the great light, according to this is what the indigenous call it, right? And yet here we are now, this is exactly what you're expressing is that we all have that connection with each other. And we're all conscious. We're all able to make the choices. How do you see, or how, guys, so many questions. How do you see the evolution of getting people to understand this taking place as we proceed out of COVID? Well, I, um, I think a lot of people right now are unhappy and frustrated with the state of the world. Um, I'm very optimistic about things because I think there's never been a better time to start a global peace movement, right? If people are frustrated. If you're on the, the R side of things, you're frustrated. If you're on the D side of things, you're frustrated. Most people in the world are frustrated. And, and the answers to our problems, I think, are live and let live, right? If we could imagine if we could just apply that philosophy mm -hmm. even to the corona pandemic, right? Well, we're start, I mentioned adversarial relationships earlier it seems like whatever we perceive the narrative to be regardless of that there seems to be this polarization being set up and whether it's an argument between the two camps 
and because of that, there is this inability to come together. Totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. How would you see that evolving? Well, I think there's been a complete breakdown of communicate all communication, certainly civilized communication. And so I see this as an opportunity. I see this as a niche in the market. I'm, uh, I'm going to run for Senate. I'm going to do it in a very civilized way. I'm going to be talking about the big issues. I'm going to be pushing live and let live. I'm going to be talking about our moral principle and our legal principle. And I'm going to answer every question entirely consistent with those two principles all the time. So um, just because something doesn't violate the legal principle, and I would, I would, as a result, say that the conduct should be legal, doesn't mean that I'm condoning it. In fact, I could speak out against it. I could try to persuade you. Take, for example, earlier, I threw out, I was for legalized methamphetamine. Okay, well, if you're a competent adult, you get to decide what goes in your body. But if you said, hey, Mark, I think I'm going to try meth tonight, I would say, Zen, I think this is a bad idea. I would try to convince you not to do it. Just because I think it's legal doesn't mean I think it's the right thing to do. What that means is I recognize you as the person who makes the ultimate final decision about what goes in your body, just like I I claim mm -hmm. the right to uh, what goes in my body, but we can still have a conversation. I might say, Zen, why don't you try a whole food plant-based diet and see how that hits you for a while? And you may right. say, no, Mark, I'm not interested in that. I, I eat whatever I want. I say, well, okay. I, yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm on your case. I, we're pescatarian, so yeah. mostly whole foods, but occasionally. Um, you know, this is really in the, the, the notion of giving people space to be who they are and make the choices that they make and supporting those choices, we don't, do you think that there is enough consideration given to the multiplicity of issues and, and situations and environments and um, constraints that, that, that each individual faces in, in order to be able to move forward in their own lives and support their families? Right? There, there are huge challenges in that with what people are being asked to do. Yeah, I think that most issues are connected and related, right? I think people might see issue A as a separate analysis and issue B as a separate analysis. I think they're the same questions. Who gets to decide these questions? Whose property is that issue, right? Mm -hmm. Who, who's in charge? Who's the iron? Who's, who's property? Who's the iron-fisted dictator? That's the person who makes the decision. But that doesn't end the discussion. We should try to help each other. That's why I think voluntary kindness is important. Kindness isn't really kindness anymore if it's forced, right? Charity is not charity if the government forces you to do it. Morality requires that there's a choice to turn left or to turn right. If there's no choice, then I'm not impressed uh, with what, what things you do, right? So we have to give people, people have a right is a better way to say it, to decide for themselves how they want to live. We can demand that they not be aggressors and we should demand that. But beyond that, all we can do is make suggestions, but we should make suggestions. I think somebody does need to stand up and say, look, can we agree to disagree in a civilized way? Let's have a civilized conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's not call each other names. I was, I was frankly disgusted and shocked when uh, Trump was the president and he would have nick these horrible derogatory nicknames for everybody. That's not the way to lead a free people. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think everybody should be treated with respect, right? Because at the end of the day, there aren't really good people and bad people. There are only imperfect people who do both good and bad things, right? So we want right. to inspire people to do more of the good things and less of the bad things. That's what we and, should do. And, and we never really understand or take the time to understand the other. You know, I have, I have a good friend, mentor, and, and you may even know him, Jerome Landau. Um, he's her lawyer, uh, local lawyer as well. He expressed to me, uh, years ago that in his opinion, there really is no conflict. There's simply misunderstanding. The misunderstanding comes because you've got two different dictionaries. If you've got two people, right, that show up at the same table and you don't understand the, uh, the other person's dictionary. So there's that necessary time where you have to get to know each other and, and understand the other's perspective in order to appreciate your own, or maybe even shift your own, 
Yeah, I, I would be remiss if I didn't throw out habit five of the seven habits. Seek first to understand. In the exactly. Then, That's, I was hoping you would bring that up. Yeah, understood. exactly. Communication problems are huge. They sneak up on you all over the place. So I would encourage everybody to look before you get into a big argument. Why don't you pause, take a step back, take a deep breath and say, hold on. Let me make sure I'm understanding what it is you're saying. Let me try to repeat it back to you. Are you saying this, 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 and this? Get a yes before yeah, you move yeah. on. Yeah, that's called active listening. Yes. Absolutely. And and it's part of the um, what is it? MVC, nonviolent communication, um, or one of the aspects of it. Now, how that's a discipline, right? Yeah. You really have to train yourself to do that. So yeah. In your experience, when you were first learning to do this, how did you train yourself? Just by trying to make it happen, right? To put it in the forefront of my brain. It's just like meditation, right? When mm -hmm. you first sit down and try to follow the breath, we already know you're two breaths, three breaths, you're going to be onto something else, right? We know this, that people, it's unfortunate because I think people say, oh, I tried that meditation. It didn't work. I got distracted. I can't do it. you got to practice. Sure, you're supposed to initially. Right. right? That's but you're supposed to notice the distractions over time and be able to, neg to, to navigate or negotiate them. Yeah, it's about mindfulness, having presence yeah. of mind. So the next time you're in, you're getting ready to have some big, powerful, heated dispute with another person, you got to have the presence of mind to step back and say, hold on, let me, because how many times have you been in a discussion where it ended with, Oh, that's what you were saying. Well, why didn't you say so at the beginning? Well, I did. And you, know, you get into the, you waste right, it. Because you, the, the hearing hadn't adjusted to hear it from right. that place. Now, right. you know, you've been to a lot of places. Uh, and let me ask, have you, um, you've been to Mexico? Have you ever been to, to Tulum or visited uh, Chichen Itza, that area? I, I've been to Mexico many times. Okay. So the road out of Tulum on the way to, I think it's, well, the first one is um, something boa. Um, anyway, what, one of the ruins, but there's a clearing there. My wife and I were there on honeymoon a few years ago, and we're driving down the, the road through the jungle, and all of a sudden the clearing opens up, and there's two signs. And we, we'd been talking about self-awareness, and the signs were in English. And one of them said, they were butted up against each other in the uh, clearing. One said, observe your intentions. Wow, excellent. And the other said, observe your distractions. Wow, fantastic. Really great messaging, yeah. And so timely. I mean, we've been talking about this, and then here's one of the synchronicities about how the universe kind of works together. Everything's connected. We know that. We just don't necessarily <laughs> are, are aware of it in the moments of, of those triggers, right? We get swept away, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we get swept away. Um, so would, would you say that that's kind of a... A one way to discipline is to see things as being able to observe your intentions, the intention being to live and let live, right? Well, I, and I, the distractions to that. I think step one is to commit to bring out a better version of yourself, right? Step one, mm -hmm. you have to first say, okay, number one, I'm going to unveil a brand new version of Mark J. Victor, the best one so far, and then decide what it is you're going to step up. You know, my resolution for this year was I'm going to step up everything in every area. I'm going to do better in everything that I do. Don't and you feel a little bit vulnerable in that place, though? I'm, I don't pretend to be perfect. I, if I make a mistake, I, I say, look, I, sorry, I made a mistake. Sorry, I'm imperfect. And I'm the best I could ever be is an imperfect guy acting imperfectly. I try to do things uh, appropriately and as close to perfect as possible. But I know this isn't, this isn't reality. So I know I'm going to make mistakes. I'll, I'll make more mistakes in the future, but I'm going to own them. I'm going to publicly admit them and I'm going to learn from them. And I'm going to try the most to important part. I'm not going to pretend like I'm perfect. I don't set the expectation there. I'm hundred percent ferociously and relentlessly committed to excellence, but I know I'm never going to achieve perfection. That's, sure. I think that that's the position to me that makes the most sense. Well, again, there, what's your intention? Your yeah. intention is to be your best self and, and recognize that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make mistakes. That's how I learn. If we're not challenged, if we don't have those things, then, you know, the greater the challenge, the greater the learning. Right. And 
then there's the flip side of that. The greater the challenge, the greater the learning, the more responsibility you have for your own behavior. You should, we should all take 100% responsibility for our own behavior. But you know, my attitude, and I, I developed this over the last few years, and maybe this sounds simple and I should have figured it out a lot sooner, but I'm really committed to the notion that I'm 100% responsible for everything that I do, but I'm also 0% responsible for everything that anybody else does. Like I don't take responsibility for what other people do. I'm responsible for me, but I got to own that. And I'm happy to own that. We should all own that. I think that um, I would love it if more people said, you know what, I'm in charge of me. And, and it's this again, it starts with meditation. I believe if you're not in charge or get some handle over your moods, over your perspective on the world, right? You can choose to see the glass half empty or the glass half full. And, you know, my wife, I just want to get this out there. My wife, I'm so fortunate to have this wonderful wife who was born in a third world country. She was from Burma, which is now known as Myanmar. And whenever she catches me frustrated over some problem, which happens, she'll say a phrase to me. She says, you know what, Mark? First world problems. And I think about that. And at first I had to think, is, is this a bunch of, you know, happy uh, BS or whatever. And then I thought about, no, it really isn't. It really true. If you've ever been to a third world country, you know that there is no BS in that phrase right there. Chances are very high. Whatever problems you're thinking about or worried about or concerned about, these are problems you are absolutely fortunate to have. They're first world problems. And let's rejoice that we have such problems to solve. I don't worry about clean water. I don't worry about whether my kids are getting enough calories to survive on the planet. I'm not worried that somebody's going to come charging through the door and chop my head off or something right now. These concerns are uh, third world country kind of concerns that, that I'm free from that is something to rejoice in. And if I got a car problem or someone's driving slow in front of me or something, and I catch myself getting upset over that, I eventually find myself embarrassed. I think, what would people in the third world think of me upset about this problem right now? What I hear you saying is that you hold the picture. It doesn't matter whether the glass is half full or half empty. It's how you look at it. It's your perspective. Yeah. Frankly, I think the word- I, I meant the picture, you know, you, you've got the ability to refill it, but whatever, right. you know, it's that personal choice, the personal perspective that you have to be able to see things a little clearer as they are and take into account the perspectives that we miss because we are so fortunate. Yeah, I would say perspective is the most important concept to get your brain around if you're interested in your own happiness. And perspectives uh, are so many. And the, the more perspectives you can have on your own experience, the more clear you will see rea your reality because yeah, I, you can see it from multiple places. Yeah, I, I just think people should try this, right? Take me up on it. The next time you can, if you can have the presence of mind to catch yourself the next time you're so frustrated or upset or whatever, just say, is this a first world problem? And chances are it is. And be rejoice that you are, your problems are of the first world variety. And this had, by the way, none of us had anything to do with where we were born, when we were born, how we were raised. Not, we were very, very lucky. We are among the luckiest humans to have ever lived on the planet. We live better than the richest kings lived just a few hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. We are in very good shape. We have very little to nothing to complain about. Well, and there is also that mm, thoughtmosphere of those who feel like we choose the, that the ultimate choice is still choice that we choose who we are we choose our parents we choose when they enter the world we choose where we enter the world and that they're because and especially now it seems and maybe you can reflect on this that there's this natural order that's bubbling up within humanity that's seeking the balance and the harmony that we know can exist and that in so doing there's this 
potential for applying the skill sets that we've developed into discovering a more congruent per or perfected form, fit, and function in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the people who have become, I don't know, maybe more enlightened is the word here, or at least more aware of the fact that you can really- Conscious, be, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Help, help your fellow brothers and sisters get the same perspective. We should all be celebrating. It should be a party every day that we're alive, right? We never, we don't know how much time we have left. We should be celebrating every moment of life. Like right now, right. we should be so happy at, in this moment, not, not thinking about, oh, what I got to do tomorrow or what happened yesterday. This is what Buddha called suffering, right? <laughs> this truly is suffering. You can't well, do a thing about anything that happened in the past. Now, do you, or are you of the belief that politics can truly become a party of celebration for what we're able to do for each other? in the right ways. That's exactly what we're trying to do with the Live and Let Live movement. And frankly, part of the reason I'm running for office is I wanna stand up and say, look, I'm a Live and Let Live guy because we're gonna have people running all over the world in different countries and in different parties who are all gonna self-identify as I'm a Live and Let Live guy or I'm a Live and Let Live woman or whatever. And we're gonna push them all to the Live and Let Live website and hopefully win hearts and minds and then at some point when there's enough of us, the world is going to be recalibrated around a principle that we call live and let live. And when that happens, life on earth will be dramatically improved. Absolutely. And the systems that we have will be in order to where, for one, the basic needs of everyone will be taken care of because we have that capacity to do so now. We just don't. Through voluntary kindness, not through right. forced kindness. Right. Forced kindness isn't kindness at all. It's, it's perfectly consistent for me to say, look, I am against laws that force my neighbor to help another neighbor. You don't have to do that legally. But I definitely want to inspire people to help other people. It's as strong and forcefully as I possibly can in an intellectual kind of way. We should inspire other people to help, not force them to help. That never works you mentioned out. Well. The intellectual side of it, where you're asking people to go, at least this is what I think I'm hearing or sensing, is a visceral experience of that attitude, not an intellectualization, which kind of still puts things in categories and, and um, boxes, right? It, it's more of a an overall experience with each other that brings that sense of, of collaboration community to a whole new level. Yeah, I'll tell you, Zen, and you, you should really take me up on this. You should come to one of our monthly leader meetings where we get together with the leaders of Live and Let Live from around the world and 10 different countries in Africa with guys going like this. I was up at four o'clock in the morning one, one day this week to give a presentation to Nigeria that's running a Live and Let Live conference over there. And so the, what's evolving is this global community. And what we say to each other now is live the message. Don't just spout the message out. Don't just- Gotta be the example. Be the example. Don't yeah, just you, talk about- You send about me the link, I will be there. Yes, don't just talk about <laughs> voluntary kindness. Live it. Don't just talk about open-mindedness and tolerance and, and civility. Live it. Be the living, walking, breathing- Otherwise it's empty. Right. It just becomes another empty promise right. from the Republicans or the Democrats or some other party just to get elected or something like that. Now, how would you see this showing up in a concerted effort, let's say here in the States, in what, in how we can reframe or maybe restructure the political system here? Well, we can't do anything until we have enough people who have in their hearts and in their minds this live and let live principle. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, none of us can predict what will happen next. Take, for example, sure. marijuana legalization. 
something I've been fighting for for many, many years, and it happened. And, and no one ever thought it would happen in Arizona. But it didn't <laughs> happen because politicians led the way. It happened because enough people said, you know what, let's stop locking people up for smoke, for peacefully smoking weed. And then what happened was interesting. Either politicians woke up and changed, put their finger in the air and saw which way the wind was blowing and said, you know what, I've changed my mind. I'm going to buy some grow houses. After Yes, right. <laughs> after decades of supporting locking up our fellow peaceful human beings and ruining their lives, all of a sudden, I think it's okay to smoke a joint. So they kept their seats. Others didn't change their view and they got voted out and other people got voted in. And uh, there yet are other ways that things change, right? The American Revolution, the revolution wasn't the war. The revolution was the change in thinking, if you read what the founders wrote. So I don't know you. we're after the same thing. We want a revolution in thinking. We need, to, we need to really coalesce around this live and let live principle, the ideals around it. When that happens, I, I can't exactly predict the world is... Uh, is a complex system. I don't know exactly how things are going to offload. I do know that it will happen when enough people demand it. And it uh, is happening slowly. I mean, you and I are talking about it right now. That This is part of that process. All the shows that I've uh, recorded so far, there's been an element of this and, and the theme throughout it all is how do we, you know, connect on that inner place with each other, the namaste, the in la catch, and recognize how we can all come together to restore the natural dignity and honor that we each have from wherever we came from. Yes, right? it's like the inalienable rights. We need to resurrect these sort of old-fashioned ideas about working together and being a community voluntarily, right? Not forcing it to happen, but because we, we want it to happen. Help your neighbor because you want to help your neighbor. Well, it takes a tremendous amount of self-initiation. And, and so how do you, how would you see that developing? And what are the kinds of things that people might do? So let's say they're reluctant to, to be that self-initiating initially, just really pop out of the box and, and get involved. What might be some small things that people could do to to help them take some initial action to begin to experience what this new storytelling series might be like? Great question. Um, look, it, it could be as simple as just join the Live and Let Live movement. Go to liveandletlive.org, say, join the movement, give us your name, your email, be part of the community. That's a big help, right? Because when we can stand up and say, we got millions and millions of people like the NRA does, right? Like other big groups do. This is how you get things done. We need to have enough people on our side. If you're more ambitious than that, you can start a chapter. We're, we're starting chapters right now all over the world. If, if there's not a chapter in your area, no big deal. Let me know you want to start a chapter. We'll help you put some people together, run a monthly meeting. No big deal. This doesn't have to require an awful lot of you know money or time or anything like that. You could donate money if you have money. You could get on a committee, talk it up, send it out on social media. Say, hey, I just learned about this new global peace movement. Check it out at liveandletlive.org and let's make it happen. We're not well, in and that's one of the things about social media. The theme of that or the best practice, right, is no like, follow, and share. Yes. So how difficult is that? You got a few moments, you know, click a few buttons, send some information, and it doesn't take much effort at all. Right. Be part of the solution. If you like what we've been talking about on this show, get involved. Be, don't just sit around and say, that's great. We need you. We, need, we want to make it happen in our lifetime. We don't want to just talk about it. It's not just an intellectual exercise. We want to leave the planet better than we found it. If that seems like you, then get involved and help out. We're, we're asking. We need more people. We're trying to get the good people of the world, the decent people of the world, to come together at least around this idea of live and let live. You may live however differently you want to live. No problem. You're welcome in our movement. We celebrate differences. Just don't be an aggressor. That's our only demand. That shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> Just play nice. Right. You know, can't we remember the old phrase, you know, can't we all just get along? You know, I, yeah. 
I like to describe them as the rules that you learned when you went to kindergarten. Remember the teacher said, look, keep your hands to yourself and don't take the other kids toys without their permission. Okay, these are good don't rules. Bite. They're still good rules. Absolutely, all right. And, you know, as adults, why do we lose that? What, what do you, what's the crux of, of how or why we give up our agency? Well, I think what happens is if you, if you look at the political discourse, neither the R's nor the D's are making any mention of a difference between legal rules and ethical rules or moral rules. This is a critical, important point to get. This is why we have a legal principle and a moral principle. People have to understand, and even the morality that they personally agree with still needs to come out of the law, right? That's mm -hmm. the cost, as I keep saying. If you're not willing to pay that cost, then you're signing us up for an en endless struggle with each other to get control of the law and force your views on everybody else. Now, do you think that the laws we have on the books or the way they've been able to be manipulated has helped facilitate the corporate takeover? Because it appears, at least to many, and I'm one of them, that our um, representative government really isn't in charge, that it's more done through the money and the lobbying and the corporate control and the ways that they've been able to manipulate the, the laws in order to have things in their favor. Would, would you know, you maybe I'm an reasonable a, assumption. I may be in the minority here, okay. but um, I don't blame money in politics. It's not money that causes people to go in and vote for well, it. I realize it's a choice of those who are affected by it. However, yeah. the fact is they've been affected. Well, that's on them. Okay. We, need to, we need to take control of ourselves and say, look, I understand I keep seeing that political ad over and over and over and over again. That's not enough to get me to buy in. You know, just, and I've always wondered this since I've been a little kid, that you see a sign on somebody's front yard that says, vote for Bob. How can oh this, yeah, I'm gonna go vote for Bob. <laughs> how can this be effective? I don't understand that if you could put a, a sign on everybody's front yard that said vote for Bob, how does this translate into votes for Bob? Well, have, speaking of Bob, let's go to a Bloom, um, Howard Bloom specifically. Have you ever read the Lucifer Principle? No. So what it is, is it's Howard Bloom also wrote The Global Brain. He did a scientific study of the history of how small groups of people manipulated massive populations through lies told over and over again through control of the, whatever media, right, the narrative, and that the and the, those were eventually believed by the people just lockstep. Right. So it appears that that's kind of what's been happening even of recent, and it's so blatant that it's obvious to a lot of people, yet what can we do about it, right? These are the things that, like you're talking about, it's not necessarily the money or the power, and I agree with you. It's the people who've made the choice to um, be influenced yeah. by that. And so now we need to find others that cannot be influenced by that. Yeah, so two points here. First, obviously, we got to do better as, as competent adults and, and really be a little bit more thoughtful in terms of how we act and what we do and, not, and be less susceptible to either the echo chambers of Facebook and Instagram and all these other things and, and just more Which thoughtful. is 90% negative. Yeah, or maybe not that much, but definitely bad news travels faster and there's more proliferation of it. And then the second point, maybe more of a practical point here is we certainly don't need to convince everybody. Um, the American Revolution is estimated to have been supported by about a third of the people. Okay, uh, I don't think much has changed since then. About a third on one side, a third on the other side, and a third that don't really care. And so we need to get to our third. Is it possible that the message, that the resonance, that the honest, authentic being that comes out of that would make so much sense that it's irrefutable in how it's felt and that that alone would draw people up and to engagement? I or at least maybe not with you, but with something similar. 
Well, I sure right. hope Live and Let Live brings that kind of a message. That's what we're trying to do. It should be, and it is an inspirational type of a message. It's the kind of thing mm -hmm. that the people in the movement say, I just feel it in my heart. I know this is the right way for us to interact on the planet. And as I tell everyone in our uh, global meetings, when we talk about this, the only thing standing between us and success is our ability to deliver this message in a way that people understand, because I believe far more than one third of the people on the planet would agree with what it is that we're saying if they understood what we were saying. That's the challenge. Education is always a challenge, is it not? It is. And, and the way the words, the language, the tone, uh, the imagery, all of, of how that communication is delivered. And you mentioned that being kind of a challenge uh, uh, in both my master's degrees. The, the first thing that came up was that communication is a challenge across the board. No that question. It's been ineffective and oftentimes I think inauthentic because it's the way, you know, this is, this is how we've done the status quo, right? This is how we've done it. This is how we continue to do it. And that's just how it is. Well, it isn't. It doesn't have to be. To criticize myself once again, uh, when the younger Mark Victor leads the message with legalized methamphetamine, the message is never going to get across. I'm going right. to get hand wave, oh, you're crazy, and that's the end of that. Wouldn't it be better to lead the message with live and let live and competent adults are in charge of their own bodies and these kinds of concepts and get them to understand that? And then even if, like you and I may agree, uh, somebody ingesting red meat is probably not healthy for them. But that's not a decision we get to make for them. That's a dis They may say, we, are, we agree with you as well. We think it's unhealthy, but I'm happy to do unhealthy things and eat red meat or smoke cigars or whatever they want to do. That is the nature of defining and pursuing your own happiness. If it's cigars and red meat that make you happy, make yourself happy. Go for it, right. Right, right. No problem. It's live and let live. This should obviously make sense. We're not trying to change the law to get people to be open-minded or tolerant or kind. Well, it's a, one of the other things that came up, um, this has been oh, 10 years ago, um, you're familiar with the ISO group, right? The International Stand or International Organization of Standards. It's kind of an interesting acronym. But, yes. Okay. So the, the 9000 series is used in manufacturing for right. quality control and, yeah. and getting certified to, to do so. Well, they have uh, what's called the ISO 26000 social responsibility standards, right? It was ratified by 92 countries in 2010. Hardly anybody knows about these and what they are, are a set of guidelines for intentional activity. It's not forced. Well, it's, then that's great. That's right? the big point, right? If it's not intended to, usually the conversation doesn't go there. Usually the conversation is, this is what we support and that's the end. And it's left to people to figure out you know, what you, that we support it. Does that mean we're putting it into the law or that we're just encouraging people? Well, that's the important part of the equation that should be talked about. Right. Well, what I think was intended for this is to use the document as kind of a groundswell to move it up through the companies, the corporations, things like that, of being better stewards of their community. I love it. This is great. Yeah, sounds great to me. I think this is... These are the kinds of things that we should be doing as responsible, competent adults on the planet Earth during the short period of time we're here. Cool. Mark, I really appreciate, that seems like a good segue, right, to kind of close things up. It's been great to reconnect and have the conversation. It was better than I ever anticipated it would be because you hit things that, that yeah, you knocked it out of the park, man. Awesome. Um, Thanks, and bro. I know that this will make a difference to our audience and, and the information for Live and Let Live and, and uh, in, anything else that you would like for me to include will be below the, the uh, video in the description. Zen, we want you. We want you in the Live and Let Live movement. You're a great representative. We'd love for you to add your talents and skills to what it is we're trying to do here. I'll accept that invitation, Mark. Awesome, awesome. Peace, brother. This is what we do in the live and let live. We All right. Mahala. <laughs> Mahala, man. We flash because, you know, interestingly enough, 
the people who really understand things in Hawaii say, you know what? The aloha spirit is exactly the same thing as live and let live. Yep. Another way to say the same principle. Yep. Yep. And it's that way in, in multiple cultures. Yes. Mark, thanks again. And namaste and in la catch. Thanks so, so much for staying with us through this episode of One World, the New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time. Thanks, brother. Peace.